Good morning. I don't know about you, but uh, after the church today, I think I'm going to go make myself an ice cream cone and find an orange soda and make myself one of those. That looked really good, didn't it? Finally, and is better, something that really does look good. Not blueberries and spam and uh, raspberries and onions. If, if you're joining us for the first time today, we're, in a, we're wrapping up a series called And Is Better. And every sermon we've started with a video that blended things. And each week we're like, that's not better. And so finally they found some things that go well together. They sound really good to me. And um, I'm, uh, I'm so glad you're here. This is wrapping up our series. And the whole series started from James chapter 2 six weeks ago. You may remember that. And we discovered this idea of faith and deeds. And is better. Not faith or deeds. And it's not faith plus deeds. It's our deeds reveal that we have faith. Faith and deeds. And we began to explore this whole idea in the Bible that, that and is better. And we kept seeing all these examples throughout the scriptures. Uh, as we walked through this, these, um, these Sundays, saw grace and truth, death and resurrection, trust and obey, agree and, and support. Big, God uses big groups and small groups to grow us. And last week, Pastor Jamie did attend and serve. It's good to come to church, but it's even better when we serve. And today our two words are deep and wide. <clears throat> and uh, maybe when you hear these words, you may think, like I did when I first thought of them, of the song that I grew up singing. Anybody grew up singing a song in church called Deep and Wide? Um, it's a song I learned in Sunday school, and then we even sang it in an adult church. And I won't sing it for you now, but it's a, it's a song that I think came from Ephesians 3, 18, where Paul... The Apostle Paul is talking about the love of God. And he says, I want everyone to have the power to understand the God's love. That everybody should understand this. How wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of God is. And those two words, deep and wide, describe this love of God. And um, I tell you, I certainly thought of that as I was thinking through that scripture and thinking of the scriptures in the Old Testament that to describe God's love like an ocean. This past week, I was on an ocean cruise down from Florida down to the Caribbean or Caribbean, however you say it. And our family took a cruise. Many of you may remember last year, uh, we had our 10th year anniversary as uh, being at this church. And you had a big party for us and you blessed us by uh, giving us tickets to go down to Florida and uh, take a cruise as a family. And I don't know if you were aware of that, but you did that for us last June, but we weren't able to do it until this past week when my, all my family were able to go. My daughter was, uh, got off a of spring break, so we took our 10th year anniversary cruise in our 11th year, <laughs> but we did it and we had a blast. And I know some of you thought that I was glowing today because I'd been close with God and I'd been on the mountaintop and I had this glow, but no, it's just a sunburn. And uh, it's, uh, we had a great time and I'm, I'm looking out over this cruise, never been on a cruise with my family like this, it was amazing. And um, as far as you could see, water everywhere on top of this boat you know you could look around 360 degrees and as far as you could see water and it and it was deep and it was wide and I it gave me a new appreciation of the deep and wide love of God and of course this love that the Bible describes as higher than the heavens and and deeper than the deepest deep and this deep and wide love is, is, uh, is that way so it can cover our sins. There's no sin that's so deep in our life, no stain of sin that's so deep that the blood of Christ cannot wash away, that the love of Christ cannot wash away. And there's no person who's so far from God that the love of God cannot reach them, amen? God's love is deep and God's love is wide. And you put those two words together, and is better. And God's love is like that, deep and wide. And, and I want to talk about the deep and wide love of God today. 
but I want to do it in some ways that you might surprise you. Because I got thinking about this love of God that's so deep and so wide. And, and I thought about that's the kind of love that caused God to say, I'm going to send my son to redeem this world that is so rebellious and so far away from me. And you, maybe you're familiar with that passage in 1 John chapter 4 where John writes and says, this is how God showed his love, this deep and this wide love. How do we see that? This is how God showed it. He sent his only son. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. That's our world. That's the good news. That might remind you of John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He sent his son. So it's, it's imperative that we understand that God's deep and wide love is not just out there somewhere. God's love is not abstract. God's love moved him, and it ought to move us. God's love moved him to send his son. Now, remember the words, the word sent, okay? And I want to put up another verse on the screen that is something that Jesus said the night of his resurrection. Jesus died on the cross, was raised from the dead, appeared to his disciples, and said to them in John chapter 20, verse 21, as the Father sent me. What's he talking about? He's talking about the love of God that caused God to send his Son. Jesus says, as the Father and his love sent me, so I'm sending you. He's, who's he talking to? He's talking to followers of himself. He's talking to disciples. He's talking to you and I if we are followers of Jesus. And I don't know if you are today. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then this verse is to you. As the love of God sent Jesus, and as Jesus came to this world full of love of God, he says, now I'm sending you. I'm commissioning you. When you send somebody to do something, you're sending them on a commission, a, a task to fulfill. And what is that task? What is the love of God in Christ sending us to do? Well, uh, a couple of days later, a, a couple, actually a, about a month later, Jesus, just before he ascended to heaven, came back to this theme of sending this love that caused him to leave heaven and come to earth, this deep and wide love of God that was stirring in his heart that he now sends his disciples on a great commission. And many of you are familiar with this, this verse in Matthew 28. It is called the great sending, the great commission where Jesus says, now go and make disciples of all nations, that is, all ethnicities, all people groups. That's what the Greek idea, Greek word means, ethnos. Every different language, every different ethnic group. Go make disciples of all those people, baptizing them. We just saw a baptism this morning. Baptizing. Why did we baptize those three people? Because they were confessing their allegiance to Jesus Christ. And we baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We were obeying the Great Commission. Dave was used by God to bring Jason and Catherine to Christ. And uh, now to baptize them is a powerful picture of exactly what Jesus was talking about. And I want to ask you this morning. The love of God that's deep and wide that caused God to send His Son... And the love of Jesus Christ that was deep and wide that caused him to die on the cross for you. And that he says now sends us to go make disciples. Is that what you're doing? Are you full of the deep and wide love of God that's moved you so much that you are obeying the great commission? Are you about obeying the great commission? I want you to answer that question in your own heart today. And a lot of Christians... And a lot of church people, and they shouldn't be confused because they're not always the same thing, are living in disobedience to the great commission. Not the great suggestion, the great command, the great commission. Go and make disciples. 
what we have is a lot of people who've come to Christ and whether it was a real conversion or whether it was just I want some fire insurance or whether it was just an emotional thing, but they've come to Christ and then they just go. And they, they leave his presence and they just live for themselves. People come to church every week and they come and they sing and they listen and they go, but they don't go and make disciples. And here's one more example of and is better. Jesus didn't say go or make disciples. He said go. What's the next word? Say it with me. And. And is better. Go and make disciples. Now, I don't know whether it's just disobedience or whether it's ignorance that we just don't know what that means or whether it's just I get wrapped up in my own world and I forget about these words but there's a lot of us that are not obeying the great commission to go make disciples we've been sent we've been filled with the deep and wide love of God but we're keeping it to ourselves I think some of the reason is that there's confusion about what exactly does it mean to go and make disciples and um, I, I'm willing to, to accept that there is some confusion there. And it's one of my jobs is to help clear up that confusion. And there's all kinds of different views about what does it mean to go make disciples. And, and I'm grateful for those who are at least trying to do it, who are at least going out and doing it. Sometimes the, the, um, the going and making disciples turns into go and get decisions. And there's a lot of Christians who think that's what Jesus meant. Go uh, get people to come to Christ. Go lead people to Christ, which is a wonderful thing. But will you help me see, or let me help you see, that's not what Jesus said. As good as a thing as it is, go help people come to Christ. As good as it is to help people put their faith in Christ, as important as that is, and it is very important, that's, that's evangelism. It's huge. Evangelism is not discipleship. I know I just stepped on some of your toes. It's amazing to me how many people, even pastors, blur these two ideas and think of evangelism as discipleship. Leading people to Christ is not obeying the Great Commission. I know some of you have been told your whole life that that's what Jesus said. Go do evangelism, but that's not what he said. He did not say, go lead people to me. He said, go make disciples. And you say, pastor, what's the difference? Well, you tell me, is there a difference between somebody being born as a baby and growing up as a baby and growing up as an adult? Is there a difference between being born and growing up, hello? Is there? Yes, there is. There's a difference. In the same way, being born, that's evangelism. Someone leads you to get born again, that's becoming a Christian, that's evangelism. That starts the discipleship process. Hopefully, that you come to Christ, you surrender your life to Christ, and then you begin the process of becoming a disciple and growing up. And there's a lot of people who have come to an altar or who've raised their hand, or who have done something in a service that says, I, you know, follow, I'm, I, I want to commit my life to Christ, or I surrender, or I repent of my sins. Awesome! But you've just begun! Now, you follow Jesus in order to learn from Jesus, in order to become like Jesus. That's what a disciple is. And so discipleship is a, includes evangelism, but it's not the same thing as evangelism. Is, does this make sense? Evangelism is leading people to Christ. Discipleship is the helping become like Christ. See the difference? Evangelism is helping people come to Jesus. Discipleship is helping them grow up and grow deeper in Christ so they become more and more and more like Christ. Because a disciple is someone who's following Jesus to learn from Jesus, to become like Jesus. So we've, we've got this idea of discipleship that it's, help, it's a process that includes people coming to Christ, but it, it's also the process of helping them become like Christ. That's, that's clear from Scripture, but there's still 
a lot of confusion about what discipleship means. There's still a lot of confusion about what discipleship is. Let me take you on a journey of my, my own journey of me growing as a disciple. Um, the first time I remember hearing about discipleship was uh, soon after I became a Christian and it was described as having daily time with God. It was called quiet time. Anybody remember that language? Or it was called devotions. Have you had your devotions yet this morning? And, and I still love that language because I still love what that's all about. And, and if you've never heard of this, this idea of having a daily time with God, it, the way it was described to me many years ago is that you spend some time every day reading the Bible, studying the Bible, um, meditating on Scripture, maybe memorizing a passage or a verse, and you're letting that Word of God get into your system and change your mind, renew your mind, and, and change your heart, and, and shape you. The Word of God is meant to shape us. And daily devotions is not just one little exercise that you do, have your little spiritual vitamin and go on your way. No, it's this time of getting alone with God, getting quiet and reading, studying, meditating, memorizing, praying the Word of God so the Word of God shapes your life. And this is why to this day, after all these years of being introduced to the daily devotions, I still, uh, we, we put out every week a daily devotional guide that is, has scripture for you to read, that has verses for you to uh, meditate on, that has a, a, week, a weekly verse for you to memorize. And then, then one of us on my team writes a prayer based upon that, th that meditation verse. I plead with you to every day download through your iPhone or your Android phone or on your computer or take a hard copy from us every day. Read that word from the New Testament and from the Psalms and, and meditate on the verse for the day and, and memorize. Like for this past week, the verse was, you know, if you want to be my disciple, then you have to deny yourself, Jesus said. Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. What a great verse to meditate on, to memorize and internalize so that it's shaping your life. And I will never, I'm a pastor, I've known Christ for years, I will never, ever get to the point where I can, where I don't need to have a daily time with God, and you won't either. Why would you want to? It's a, to miss that. It's a time of communing with Him where He's shaping you. And I'm so grateful that I was around Christians that taught me early in my Christian life the importance of a, of a daily time with God. And I urge you to do that. And if you've never done it, jump in and let the Word of God shape you. It's the most important discipleship exercise. But as I began to grow as a Christian, I began to realize without knowing the phrase, and is better. I began to realize that as important as it was to spend time with God, memorizing His Word, studying His, His Word, letting His Word shape me, um, that's not all the discipleship is. And, I, and the first time I discovered this, it was quite a revelation to me. I had a person say to me, you know, one time, you know, you wear out Bibles. You're like a Bible hound. And I was like, yeah, man, that's what it means to be a disciple. But it, it's more than that. And in my own journey, of discovering the deep and wide love of God in my own journey of being shaped, in my own journey of becoming a disciple, uh, I discovered that in my daily time with God, He was uh, deepening me. And this devotion that I was, you know, devoting myself to was turning into a, um, a new appreciation for God and His Word. A new appreciation for God and His majesty. A new appreciation for God and His holiness. As I read and studied the Word of God, I began to deepen in my worship of God. And worship was no longer uh, what I did on Sunday mornings, going through the ritual in the church that I was involved at the time, going to a worship service. No, worship became a lifestyle for me. And God was growing me, helping me realize that, watch this, 
and is better. It's the word and worship. And that God has always had these two things together. That you read the word and that causes you to worship. And you hear the word preached and that causes you to worship. And I began to see and is better. Worship in the word, word in the worship. And about this time I started going to these worship conferences. I was living in Kansas City at the time. <coughs> And this big church in Kansas City had these worship conferences all the time. And, and you would, I would go and they would be like 45 minutes to an hour of singing and worshiping God. And it was awesome. And then we'd sit down and a guy would preach for 45 minutes to an hour from the Word of God. And then we would worship and sing for another half an hour, 40 minutes. And... It was an incredible, we do this night after night in these worship conferences, I would go to these and God was just doing so much in my life and, and I began to see the rhythm of daily time with God and weekly time with the people of God and, and the daily time of studying and the weekly time of worshiping and there was a beautiful rhythm happening in my life that, and it began to shape me so again, it wasn't just daily and weekly but it was a whole lifestyle thing and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm starting to get this discipleship thing. And then I remember one morning having my devotions, studying the Word of God, worshiping God, loving what I'm learning, and I found this verse, John 13, 34, and 35. I, I don't know why I had never seen this verse before, these verses before. I'm sure I had. But do you know how when you're studying the Bible, Please tell me you know what this means. You're reading the Bible, studying the Bible, or maybe hearing a guy preach about it, and all of a sudden, just that verse comes to life, and you're like, wow, I see it. I get it. Does this ever happen to you? And it's like it's just lifted out, and it's like blazing, and that's what it was for me that day. You know, Jesus saying to his disciples the night before he died, the night before he died, a new command I give you, love one another. Love one another. Another love. It just, those words just leaped off the page like a neon sign in a dark night. Boom, love, love. And, and in, how do we love? As I have loved you. So we're to love people like Jesus. Not just any old kind of love, but as I have loved you, Jesus said, that's how I want you to love others. And then this phrase, and by this, Everyone will know you are my disciples. Not by how long you spend in devotions. Not by how many memory verses you know. Not, many, not by how many worship conferences you go to, Jim. Daily devotions and times of worship are awesome. But this is how everyone will know you're my disciple. It's by your love. Wow. I mean, that just blew my mind. I mean, by this time, I was really developing into quite a disciple. I was developing a, a, a grasp of the Word of God. I'd been in seminary, and, and I had a good handle on the Bible and the, what God was doing, and I, and I really felt like I, I knew God, and I, His character and His attributes just were captivating to me. But for some reason, it was all about loving God. And I, I just, I mean, I knew I was supposed to love people, but that, that day, that God just used that verse to open my eyes, and I began to to study other passages in the Bible. But God began to teach me about loving and about loving like Jesus and about the deep and wide love of God that, was, that caused him to send Jesus and that motivated Jesus and how that is supposed to be the defining characteristic of every follower of Jesus. This deep and this wide love of God that's this, this, uh, working in the heart of a believer so it spills out into other people's relationships and you love like Jesus. And I began to find authors like John Wesley and Larry Crabb, two completely different people from two different ages, but God used them in my life along with the scripture to shape me about what love was. And I remember studying with Larry Crabb, and, or not with him, but going to a conference and hearing him talk and, and reading his books and God introducing me through Larry Crabb to a, a a question that I still ask to this day. It's a question that I ask all the time. It's a question I believe God is asking me and asking you. It's a simple question. Here it is. How well do you love? Not how much do you know. 
Not what have you done, but how well do you love? And the more you think about that question, that's a great question. Larry Crabb taught me that question. And so when I'm in a relationship with somebody, my wife, my children, a friend, a staff member, a person I'm trying to lead to Christ, when I'm in a relationship with somebody, I'm asking the question, what does it look like to love this person well? In this situation, when they're mad at me, what does it look like for me to love them well? In this situation where I'm mad at them, what does it look like for me to love them well? In this situation where I feel so misunderstood, what does it look like to love them well? In this situation where we can't seem to break through this conflict, what does it mean to love them well? In this situation where I'm living next to somebody in a neighborhood that doesn't know Jesus Christ, what does it mean for me to love them well? You see how awesome this question is? Ask it of every relationship you're in. Ask it of your life. What does it mean to love well? What does that look like? Not what's the easy thing to do. Not what's the quickest thing to do. But in the relationship I'm in now, at this time, what does it mean to love them well? And how well do I love? Can I encourage you to write that question down? How well do I love? I believe it's a question that God's asking you. And he's asking me. And it's caused me to have to go to friends and family, my wife, my children, some of you. It's caused me to have to go to these people and say, I'm sorry, I haven't loved you well. And friends, that's what sin is. Sin is not just committing wrong deeds, doing wrong things. It's failing to do the loving thing. Sins of commission, I commit a sin. Sins of omission, I don't love as I should. That's a sin. I miss the mark of love. And when you start defining sin like that, wow, it becomes a, sin becomes a lot bigger. <laughs> sin becomes a lot uglier. It becomes a lot more difficult to, to nail down because I, I can you know, discipline my life and I can learn to, to live for the love of God and stop committing a bunch of sins, but I fail to love well all the time. Anybody else like me? Okay, two of you. Well, you can leave now. I, for the rest of us, I can't believe how many times the Holy Spirit points out to me, so you chickened out. That's what loving well is? Or, you know, you said that to that person, that's what it means to love them? I'm like, oh God, I'm sorry. I said what I wasn't supposed to say. I didn't say what I was supposed to say. I'm a sinner. Yeah, you are. I need your love. Yes, you do. I need your grace. Yes, you do. Drink it in. Thank you, Lord. And so I live in this rhythm of God pointing out sin and then me drinking in his grace and receiving his grace and his love. Lord, help me to love better. And open my eyes to love Open my heart, fill me with your love. I can't love like you did in my own strength. And when Jesus said to his disciples that night, as I have loved you, as I have loved you, that became the benchmark of what it means to love well. Don't compare the way you love to anybody else but Jesus. Amen? Love people like Jesus. Let's step back to that night once again. When Jesus said to them, I want you to love as I have loved you, let me ask you a question. When did Jesus start loving his disciples? Did he start loving them after he called them and they began to follow? Did he say, now that you're a part of my group, you know, I want to love you. Right? You understand that Jesus loved his disciples before they were his disciples, don't you? It was his love that drew them. It was his love that, that the deep and wide love in his heart that caused him to go out and bring his disciples to him and to call them out and say, follow me. The love of Christ loves people before they love God. This is why to love like Jesus includes us reaching out 
to those who don't know God and leading them to Christ. It's the deep and the wide love of God that compels us to reach out to people who don't yet know God, who are angry at God, who have rebelled against God, who are sick and tired of God, who don't believe in God, who have given up on God. It doesn't matter. It's the love that's deep and wide in us that caused God to send his son and it sends us out to reach people before they believe in God to love them. And I'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. And as I began to wrestle with this question, how well do I love those around me? How well do I love people who I, who I work with, who are neighbors, who don't know God? How well do I reach out to them and share the good news of Christ? And how well do I love? I, I realize I am powerless in and of myself to love like Jesus. Have you ever come to that understanding? We just don't have enough love inside of us to love like Jesus. Oh, we can love like other people, and you may outlove the people that you surround yourself, but you can't outlove God, and you can't even come close to loving like Jesus unless you have a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit of God on a regular basis, where He's filling you with His Spirit, filling you with His love, and you're breathing in His love and His presence and His power so that there's this rhythm, you, you receiving the love of God and then you giving the love of God to others. You seeing how you fall short of the love of God and you being filled again with the Spirit of God and learning to live filled with and led by the Holy Spirit of God. And how will you know that you are being filled with and led by the Spirit of God? That love in you will cause you to go out and serve other people. One day Jesus was... uh, with his disciples, and they had been following Jesus for quite a while, and they got in this argument about who was the greatest disciple. You know, I'm, I'm, Jesus was, he called me first, or he asks me to be with him more than he does you, and you know, I'm the greatest disciple, I'm the greatest. And Jesus overheard the conversation, he comes up to the guys, he goes, dude, dudes, guys, what are you arguing about? And they're having an argument about who's the greatest, who's the greatest disciple, and Jesus goes, he, you wanna know what it means to be a great person? a great disciple. You want to be great? They're like, yeah, yeah, you know. He says, then be a servant. The one who is the greatest is the one who is a servant of all. This is how you can tell whether somebody is actually becoming like Jesus. Are they actually full of the love of God? Are they really being led by the Spirit? It's not whether they have some special language or whether they have special visions. It's do they love well and is that love cause them to serve people? Because if you don't love and you don't serve, you're not full of the Spirit of God. I don't care what language you can speak. I don't care how, what kind of visions you have. I don't care how much you know. By this, everyone will know you are my disciple. By your love for one another. And greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. If you want to be great, then you need to be a servant. And it's filled with and led by the Spirit of God and the love of God that causes you to go out to serve people. Amen? That's what it means to be a disciple. Oh, I'm, I'm growing. I'm on this discipleship discovery. The, the love of the deep and wide love of God is, is expanding me and teaching me. And I'm developing a bigger and a wider and a more comprehensive understanding of what discipleship is. What it means to follow Jesus. What it means to become like Jesus. I'm growing like crazy. And finally, I kind of realized that if you kind of step back and look at the whole thing, which is exactly what Jesus did the night before he died, And he prays to the Father, this is my last night. I have finished what you sent me to do. John 17. Father, I have completed the work you gave me to do. I have done what you sent me. What did God send him to do? Out of the love of God, the deep and wide love of God, God sent Jesus to what? to tell people who he was, to explain who God was, to, to die on the cross, to, to, uh, to illustrate in his own life, this is what God is like. This is what God is doing. To announce the kingdom of God, to help people see that, that God was at work redeeming the world. And he was gonna do it through Christ. Jesus says the night before he dies, I've finished what you started. I've, I've 
completed what you sent me to do. Which is interesting, he, he hadn't yet died on the cross. And yet, for him, he was so in touch with the will of God, so in sync with the Spirit, that in his mind, he had already gone to the cross. He, 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 for him, he, he was there. And this is why it was the night before he died that he sweat great drops of blood. He was already suffering that night. In fact, I wonder, and I, can, I can't prove this, but I wonder, where was the greatest suffering? Was it the physical suffering on the cross or was it the, in the Garden of Gethsemane when the weight of all the sin of the world was placed on him and he began to bear our sin? And as he prayed, he's like, God, if it's possible, find another way. And yet, not my will, but yours be done. And he's bearing the sin of the world. He's taking on upon the sin of the world. He said, I came as a servant to fulfill what you called me to do. See, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a servant of Jesus. And a servant understands that I'm not here for myself. I'm here for someone else. I belong to someone else. My life, my money, my time, my spiritual gifts, my abilities, everything I am belongs to another. I'm here as a servant, as a steward of something that belongs to someone else. And discipleship is stewardship. It's learning that all of life, all of life is learning to be a good steward steward of what God has given us. Jesus understood, and now we need to understand that I'm here managing the assets of another. My body, my mind, my intellect, my gifts, my ability, my money, my children, my wife. Everything I have, everything that is around me belongs to another, and I'm just a manager. I'm the steward of it. Now, those of you who know my ministry know that what I'm doing up here is I'm painting a picture of what it means to become like Christ. Do you see it? You see how the having today devotions is that living in a connected relationship with God, which is the first C of our Christ acronym, and how worshiping God as a lifestyle is developing that heart of worship, and how loving like Jesus is relating with other-centered love. You see where I'm going with this? And how leading people to Christ is that intentional, good-newsing people, intentionally evangelizing them, and you know, living as a spirit-led servant. There you go. And then the whole thing is wrapped up by this being a trustworthy steward of God's resources. The writer of the Hebrew says about Jesus that he was a faithful servant in the house of God. He was a trustworthy steward. And if I'm becoming like Christ, and if you are becoming like Christ, there it all is. There's the Christ acronym. We're growing in these ways and we're, we're developing as disciples. That's what discipleship is. It's this process of coming to Christ and bringing someone to Christ and then helping them grow be to become like Christ. It's that big process that I just described over years and years and I'm still in the process. And it's so much more than having devotions. It's so much more than going to church. So much more than loving people. It's living by the power of the Spirit. It's all these things together. It's this process that God's working in my life. That I'm becoming a disciple. And I'm helping others come to Christ. And helping them become like Christ. And that is what we mean when we say, go make disciples. And you say, well, how do we reproduce all of that in a person's life? Here's how. We make disciples just like Jesus did. Go back with me. Go back to the beginning of the sermon. Jesus is in heaven. God and Jesus, Father and Son, are in heaven. And the Father says, it's time. I'm going to send you. Remember Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I'm going to send you. And instead of Jesus going out of heaven and kind of levitating in the clouds and speaking the good news of the kingdom of God so everyone could hear. That's not what Jesus did, is it? What did he do? He left the comforts of heaven and he came down to build relationships with real, specific people. Watch this. When Jesus wanted to preach the good news, he spoke to the crowds but when he wanted to make a disciple, he called a specific person. And if you never noticed that Jesus never called one of the disciples out of the crowd. In every case, Jesus went to where they were working. He went to their house. He went looking for them and called them specifically, you, come and follow me. He didn't say to a crowd of thousands, hey, you in the blue. Yeah, you, no, the guy next to you. Yeah, follow me. No. 
He picked them out. He went to their job. He went to their workplace. He went to their homes. He went to where they were. And he picked out particular people and said, you, follow me. Because he's not just preaching to the crowds. He's making disciples. There's a difference between just preaching to the crowds and making disciples. Watch what Jesus did. He came, he left heaven. He built relationships with specific people. And he said to Peter, James and John, Andrew, Matthew, come, follow me, hang out with me. He brought them along. He says, I want to bring you to where I'm preaching, where I'm doing ministry, where I'm healing people. I want to bring you to where you can see the move of God, where you can hear the word of God. I want to bring you along with me so you can hear the word of God preached, see the deeds of the power of God at work, and so you can experience what it means to belong. And I'm going to accept you just as you are. I'm going to love you just as you are. I'm going to draw you into my circle because I'm making disciples. I'm not just preaching to the crowds. I'm making disciples. And so I came to you to build relationships with you and said, hang out with me. And, and he said, when I go do ministry, when I preach, when I heal, I want to bring you with me so you can see God at work. And I'm going to love you and I'm going to accept you even if you're Matthew the tax collector. And I'm going to love you and accept you even if you are Judas Iscariot who will betray me. I'm going to love you and I'm going to accept you for who you are and for what I believe God wants to do in your life. I'm going to love you and accept you in a way that you've never been loved and accepted before. I'm going to help you belong before you believe. I'm not going to expect you to believe before you can belong. I'm going to let you feel the love of God, and I'm going to wrap you into my family before you believe. But it's so that you will believe. God's love is not just love for the sake of loving. God has a purpose. God has a purpose in his love. His love is that we might be a part of his family, that he might Help us see that his love can change us and we would put our faith in him and believe in him. All the time that Jesus is building relationships, he's saying, believe in me. All the time that he's building relationships, he's talking about the kingdom of God and he's sharing with them and he's inviting them. He's challenging them to believe. He doesn't wait to say believe it until he has had two or three years. From the very beginning, he's saying, believe. From the very beginning, he's building relationships and bringing them along and helping them belong. But it's all about that they might believe. And whenever somebody believes, it's so that they might start the process of becoming like Christ. Remember that Jesus had his disciples with him for three years. For three years, he's challenging them to believe. For three years, he's preaching, doing miracles, healing, showing them love. I mean, they're living with the Son of God for three years. And yet, it wasn't until after the resurrection that Jesus said to them, you finally believe. <laughs> Three years of following Jesus? Well, that's right, because believing is a process. It's not just a one-time decision. It's a process. And that's why we build and bring and help people belong so that they'll believe, so they can start their journey of becoming like Christ. And now we're back to that whole Christ acronym, and I'm not going to ask you to memorize that, but I do want you to summarize that. And that's where our three L's come in. You've ever heard us talk about these? That loving God, loving people, loving surrender, that's our summary of the, the Christ acronym. That's what it means to be a person who's becoming like Christ. You're loving God. You're loving people. You're living a life of surrender. And so around here, we affectionately call the, the five B's, the B's. And we call the loving God, loving people, living children, the L's. And we have these B's and L's things happening. Now remember, this is all because of the deep and wide love of God that's stirring in our hearts. That's why God sent Jesus and that's why he sends us. To love people. <laughs> to, to build relationships. To love people and to accept them and help them belong so that they'll believe and share the gospel with them so that they'll, be, they'll start their journey of becoming like Christ. It's all about the love of God stirring in our hearts. And we need both the B's and the L's. So we're clear about the B's, right? Build, bring, belong, believe, become. And the L's, loving God, loving people, living, surrendered. We need both. And it's better. We need the B's and the L's. Are you with me? I needed the whole sermon to explain what that meant. We need the B's and the L's in order to obey the great commission of Jesus. Again, I'm back to the very beginning of the sermon. God sent out of his love, his son. And Jesus said, as I have been sent, I am sending you to what? To make disciples. How do you make disciples? You build, bring, belong, believe, become, so they will love God, love people, live surrendered. 
See how this all fits together? This is what God's doing. This is what we understand is what it means to obey the great commission of Jesus. And I'm not saying any other church has to do it our way. But I have studied this inside and out. And this for me is how I obey the great commission. And I call you, I invite you, let's do it together. Let's do everything we can to fulfill the great commission. And that is why we're going to Vermilion. That is why we're responding to God saying, go to the next town. It's so that we can reach more people with the love of God. I mean, one day someone said to Paul, Paul, why do you do all this stuff? Why do you go out of your way traveling to the next town and go through all this trouble and all this persecution? And Paul says, for Christ's love compels me. What does he mean by that? It means that the deep and the wide love of God beats in my chest and pulsates and, and drives me to not live for myself, but to live for the kingdom of God. I can't do anything else. Once I understand the deep and love, love, of, love the deep and wide love of God, I can't do anything else but spend my one and only life reaching as many people as possible with the good news of Christ and inviting them to follow Jesus and then become like Jesus. That's what this is all about. And if you've been sitting here going, what's this whole envelope thing about? What's this whole, this whole campaign about? It's about the love of Christ that compels people who know Christ to get off of their butts and to stop living self-centered lives and to let the deep and wide love of God compel them to go to the next town, the next person, the next place that God sends us to reach as many people as possible. Am I jacked about this or what? I'm so pumped because this is why we're here. We are not here to just do church and come and hear preaching and sing. We're here to fulfill the great commission and that is why we're going to the next town. And that is why I have no problem standing up in front of you and challenging you, every single one of you, to join me in praying and asking God, how much do you want me to give? How much do you want me? What's the number you want me to give so that we can reach more people? And I'm asking all of us to do this. And I have no problem doing this. Because this is what the deep and wide love of God compels us to do. So if you have not yet filled out your envelope, today's the last day. Uh, I've, got, I've got mine right here. So if you didn't give it in today's offering, when you walk out, there'll be offering plates there. Um, you can give them to one of the ushers. They'll have a plate there. And you just drop your envelope in and, there, and your envelope may have a check in it that says I'm giving this amount or it may say I'm making this pledge. I don't have this money right now but I'm pledging. I will give this much by June 1st. That's on the envelope. I challenge you, do this today. Let all of us participate for the love of Christ compels us. And, and when we do, there'll be more and more people coming to know Jesus more and more people growing in Christ. And here's like a 30-second testimony of, of a guy from Avon Lake who says, I just want to say thank you that you came to Avon Lake. And as you hear his testimony, think about those testimonies that we're yet to hear from people in Vermilion who will one day thank us for reaching out with the good news of Christ. Here we go. I'm Gus Huska. I attend the Avon Lake campus for Open Door. And I just want to take this time to thank all of you so much from the bottom of my heart and my family's heart for making a difference here at this campus through donation, through prayer, and through love, and holding hands. Uh, even seeing the transformation of this uh, building was absolutely amazing how everybody joined together. And uh, taking this church that was uh, struggling and God has taken it and has made it new. Thanks again. We love you. Amen. God's made that church new. He's made, new pe he made people new. And how? Why? <laughs> it's the love of God. So let me just wrap this up. It's the deep and wide love of God in us. It compels us to reach out to people. 
to go deep in our faith and to reach wide in our scope to bring as many people as possible to know Christ, to help as many people as possible become like Christ, ultimately to obey the great commission to go and make disciples. Amen? Where does it all come from? The love of God. It's deeper than any ocean, wider than any ocean. It's, it's deeper than any outer space, wider than it's make a measure. It's the deep and wide love of God in the people of God that makes a difference in this generation. Let me pray over you. Father, I pray right now that you would fill us anew with this deep and wide love of God that it challenges us and that it motivates us and it compels us to go and make disciples of all people groups, of our neighbors, of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us with this kind of love. For those of us who need a fresh Filling, we ask you right now, Lord, fill us. Fill us. We don't do this to earn your favor. We do this to demonstrate our gratitude. We don't do this to get points. We do this to obey the God who has loved us with an indescribable love. So, Lord, with gratitude, we give and we go and we make disciples. And we pray this in the name of the Father, so full of love. In the name of the Son, who showed us this love. In the name of the Spirit, who fills us with this deep and wide love of God. And all of God's people said, that's right, amen.